All right, great. All right, well, just wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, we're excited to be here and to be able to present some of the work that we've been doing. Um, uh, we are testthewater.org, um, and it is, as um, Eric mentioned, a project of Four Marbles, Inc., which is a 501c3 nonprofit, um, and the, uh, who's, who has a scientific and education mission. Um, and we've been doing a lot of work with uh, water, um, transforming water data collection into digital platform um, to further scientific effort, efforts and education. Um, and we want to present the Test the Water platform um, today to you. And um, so we have uh, just me and Luke here today. Um, so Luke, you can Luke's going to be driving the presentation here. So, um, so testthewater.org give you a little bit of a bigger overview of the picture of what it is. It's really a water uh, data management platform. It's composed of uh, basically four different modules. Uh, one is uh, an in the field mobile uh, lab data book, um, lab book which allows you to do data collection in the field and um, allows you then to then sync it up to our centralized database where the, um, you can then do all of your data management around uh, the data with QA and everything. We'll show you a lot more details on that later in the talk. Um, in addition, we provide a report tool that helps you with some analytics and that type of stuff. Um, and we also have a form which allows you to um, bridge those community gaps, organize, and um, really get connected with other people um, who are also interested in uh, water data collection and water itself. <clears throat> so if you go to our website, um, testthewater.org, um, this is what you'll see. Um, it has uh, just a brief overview of some of the products and um, the different components of the platform that we'll be showing you tonight. If you um, click on the login button as a user, um, what you'll see is you'll be uh, taken over to uh, the login page, a typical kind of web login. You can log in and then it takes you um, to our forum. The forum area is kind of the staging platform for the entire platform. Um, in here, you can create posts on water-related topics. You, there's calendars for organizing um, water data collection events, uh, for posing questions, sharing information, maybe protocols or locations where observations were made um, for you. Also, to um, some key functionality in here is group creation. Um, this will come into play later in the data center where you'll see how groups are managed and um, how that applies to your actual data collection. Um, so also in the, if you look at the tabs in the um, data center, I mean, sorry, in the forum, you'll see the two tabs, one for a mobile lab book login and one for the data center. So we'll take you um, first through the mobile lab book. So if you click on that mobile lab book um, login on your mobile device, basically it will launch a um, login. So you can then basically log in to a secure access area where it will um, then download and initiate the mobile lab book on your mobile device. Um, the Mobile lab book itself is built on an HTML5 architecture, which allows it a lot of flexibility in terms of devices and things that it will work on. It basically will work on anything that can run Chrome. Um, so all of Android, basically, devices and Apple. Um, hopefully, uh, Microsoft will come on board at some point. But so basically, any any device out there that can run a Chrome web browser, you can um, run this mobile lab book on. Also, it maintains functionality in the absence of internet, so you don't need internet necessarily to do your data collection. Once you've downloaded and installed the lab book on your device, um, you are completely in independent of the internet until you want to actually interact with our central server. Um, so you can be in the field collecting data. You're fine. No signal. That's fine. Whenever you get to wherever you're going, you can just then uh, do your data review and upload at that point. Um, one thing also in addition with all the data that's collected, as long as location services have been enabled by users, 
um, all the geo, um, GPS coordinates and timestamps are associated with all the data that's collected in here. Um, and as I said, the, uh, the final step really with using it is getting your data then um, uploaded and sent over to our central database where um, I'll get into a little bit here in the next few slides. So if you compare the um, Test the Water Mobile Lab Book to a more traditional field uh, data collection sheet, and you can see here an example from uh, the uh, California um, Swamp uh, Data Sheet, which is their surface water um, ambient monitoring program. Uh, but basically, it's, which is kind of, I think, typical of a lot of um, programs that are using paper input data sheets. Uh, you have you know, uh, basically an uh, area where you can do your admin and then uh, collect samples and enter data. Um, we've organized this in somewhat of a similar fashion for consistency, uh, where we have a field observations and then we have things broken into the kind of Q WQX categories between physical, chemical, and biological, and habitat. Um, so we'll just take you briefly here through what um, a very small example of uh, data collection might look like if you're out in the field with the mobile lab book. Um, your first step in the field would be basically um, similar to your data sheet where you need to enter um, some uh, required fields basically in the, the header section of your, your field sheet. There's also some required fields with the mobile lab book. For instance, we have group name, uh, location name, a sample name. And then uh, also in this area, the collection depth which can be applied as needed. Um, you get to this area basically by uh, just clicking on that gray bar area, and then this dialog launches, and you can input these fields. And when the, they're input, um, then you can uh, they'll be displayed for you throughout your data collection. And as you need to change those, you can return to this area and just update, modify those in for uh, subsequent um, data being input or collected samples being collected. Um, you'll notice there are some fields that are not represented here that would be on a traditional sheet because um, a lot of these are also then uh, with the digital platform and relational databases, we've been able to modify processes where a lot of this is then captured also in our data center. So you don't need to re necessarily enter everything at this point in the mobile lab book, which helps to streamline uh, your in the field collection input. Um, so. Moving forward, um, the first step after entering, you see then in the gray bar there, um, the field value for the user group that the data is being collected for, along with the location, the sample name, and the collection depth have been entered. Um, and the first step usually is um, to go into an observations type field in the forms. Uh, likewise, we have a field observations area where you can input and select um, various uh, values. Um, the um, values in the gray area, which are the required fields, will be associated with every data value that you are selecting and entering here. So all the context of everything that you're entering is being maintained. Um, so after you, um, an actual data entry process would go something like this. Most people are used to uh, drop down select type menu, right, from just using websites. Um, similar thing here, so you can take a drop down select, um, click add to um, report, and you will see then up near the clipboard, incrementally the numbers will increase as you add data. So, um, or if you enter uh, data into an open form field, Likewise, when you hit the Add to Report tool, it's a uh, button, it will then update and be uh, in the, that uh, area for data review later, which I'll show you. Um, so after you've collected your major field observations, another typical thing might be to take a physical uh, property in the field um, measurement. Um, let's say, depending on your protocol, this could vary, but um, you just want to take uh, the water temperature at the site where you're also going to collect the sample. Um, so what you would do is you're actually going to take the temperature, right, and then enter that value into your lab book and click Add to the report. As uh, likewise, you're going to see the um, the value incrementally increase up near the um, the uh, clipboard uh, icon up there at the top, 
And um, so then let's say you now want to then go and collect the, your sample. So the next step would be collecting your sample depending on your protocol, as I said. And you want to have your sample labeled, obviously, as you've labeled it in uh, the mobile lab book. So this is where you, your sample maps to the value that is going to be in the database. Um, for the parameters that you're actually collecting values for, you will then uh, just click the Add to Report tool for an empty field. This will allow you to collect the sample in the field while uh, putting placeholders for each of the parameters that you're collecting around while collecting for those uh, parameters the, um, the GPS coordinates and timestamps along with the um, other uh, information um, of the group and all this uh, other, other um, required fields in the, the gray bar area. So um, simple as just clicking that box and you've got those, those data points ready. Uh, when you completed your sample collection and you're in the field measurements and your field observations, you can then click on the, um, the clipboard at the top. You can see circled there. Um, in this area, you'll be presented with all the data that's been um, recorded in your, your um, visit to um, where you're collecting your data. And you, in this area, you can review basically if you see any errors or you in, input errors type of thing. You can delete and re, um, re enter those at that time. Uh, or uh, you can click the uh, green arrow button to initiate upload and uh, syncing to our central database. As I said before, if you don't have uh, connectivity to the internet at the point, um, that's fine. Everything is still there, it's stored locally on the device. And at the point in which you have uh, connectivity, it will be uploaded all your. Your uh, GPS coordinates and timestamps and all that uh, will be maintained. Um, so, uh, yeah, so at that point, then your data should be uploaded and confirmed. Um, an additional feature uh, that the Mobile Lab Book offers is, <clears throat> is habitat photo and photo documentation of your sites. So, this works in the Lab Book by basically um, you can click. Under the Habitat Photos um, accordion sheet there, you click on that area, opens this dialog, and you can click the Generate Metadata um, and Take Photo button. What this is going to do is load all of the metadata um, in, in terms of the location name, the sample name, your latitude, longitude, uh, timestamp, and datum, these, uh, these fields. Uh, into a, into a set an area where these can then be um, when you after, after you've taken your photo it can be uh, stamped and attached to those images so those will be maintained in the database. In addition, uh, these fields are editable. Um, but what you want to do, how this would work in the field for you, is you would enter the click that button. All that metadata will be then automatically populated for you. Um, if you needed to edit it, like I said, th th those are editable. Um, but what you would then do is uh, click the Capture Image button. This will load the uh, much what most people are familiar with on um, a lot of mobile devices. Taking a photo, it's much the same, similar type of thing. Uh, a screen will uh, launch and say if you want to take a photo or choose an existing photo. So um, basically, what this allows you to do is if you're in the field and you want to take a lot of photos of an area, you can do all that. And um, make sure you, you just um, stamp these, uh, this metadata. And you can take those photos. Um, and then later, when you get back to either having Wi-Fi where your data uploads a little quicker, or if you don't want to use your data in the field for images, which can be a little bit bigger, um, you can upload those later at the time with the metadata associated. Or if you're happy to do it right there in the field, you can click Take the Photo. It will stamp it in the browser itself. And Either way, at that point, you can, um, whether you're choosing an existing photo or taking a photo, you can then click the Upload Image button, and it will upload to the database along with the, um, the associated metadata. So um, that's the uh, mobile lab book and a quick kind of uh, a very simple uh, kind of in the field data collection scenario. As I said, when all this data is being um, uh, collected by you or your team, 
uh, and you're uploading this, it's basically being then uploaded to our central uh, database. What this means for you is that you are then able to go to this our data center login area back through the forum, and you can click on that, and that will uh, give you a window, a, a new browser where you can basically log in and for secure access to the data, um, your data um, only, or and whatever groups you own. So if you log in there, basically you'll be taken into the data center. So this is kind of a typical, um, what maybe what you might see in the in uh, the data center when you log in. You can see the uh, user interface is laid out in a sequence of 10 tabs at the top. Each of these tabs um, has all the data is searchable with search fields. You can uh, sort by columns. You can uh, export your records by to CSV, Excel. You can print. All pagination and number of records are displayed. So there's a lot of uh, just organizational and, and viewing uh, uh, pluses here and designed right into the UI and, and uh, kind of view onto your data. Um, in addition, uh, as I said, one of uh, the basically the 10 tabs across the top are um, from left to right the images, then you have the lab book records, you have the lab book, or sorry, lab metadata from samples, you have uh, data quality assurance locations. This is an example of like the lo of locations field view where you can see all your data coordinates and everything are in, uh, displayed there. Um, stations, projects, equipment, there's a calibration area uh, for calibration records, data validation, which I'll get into in a little bit here, uh, along with submitted data and exported data. So each of these 10 tabs uh, basically houses uh, um, one of uh, basically 117 uh, different fields. Uh, which are include all the required fields for seeding and um, and an assortment uh, from Swamp and some of our own in-house fields from uh, which are just unique to test the water. Um, but obviously, we don't have time to go into the details of every one of these fields. But you can see there's quite a wealth for you to um, to track and add a lot of data quality assurance and uh, context to whatever type of data you're um, intending to collect. So in addition, as I said, there's um, in addition to just sample and data collection in the field, there's also photo documentation. So here um, you can see, if you go to the Images tab, you can see your images will be stored there. Uh, your images and any images submitted to your group will be visible to the group owner, um, which I'll get into a little bit with the data management side of, um, of the, the data center itself. So when you click on an image, you can see it opens into a new browser. You see the full size view of it. You can right click and download. Um, and uh, so yeah, that's that's um, some of the features of the the images. So the data center, um, as I was hinting at there, is composed of not just fields and forms, uh, but also it has a whole layer on top of it of uh, administration and data management itself. So more than just being a relational database, it's also a way for you to um, to uh, assign users and workflow through your group. So we have set up in <clears throat> in the data center um, basically four different roles. You have a group owner role who is kind of the um, the biggest administrative role. What they can do is create groups in the forum area. These groups can be public. They can be moderated or invitation only, depending on uh, what you are doing. Um, there is also in the data center itself, uh, project manager and station manager uh, levels of roles, and um, also the data collector role, which um, is kind of what I showed you there with the, the lab book itself. So. Within the data, sorry, within the data center, you have these four roles. The um, the workflow, <laughs> the the way in which data can flow through the system is can be is multifaceted, and this isn't meant to confuse you, but just to show you that the system has been built with a lot of flexibility in mind, so that whatever uh, whatever um, organization your group uh, adheres to in terms of its processes. The, the data center itself is flexible to meet those um, those processes. So 
Um, let me just lead you through one example of what a typical um, uh, kind of workflow process might be with your data. First of all, um, what you would, a lot of groups will have is the uh, mobile lab book data collector basically inputs the group ID, who they want to sign their data to, um, and then that they, they submit the data to the database and it goes directly up to that group. Um, so the next step in that is basically that group owner as the uh, lead admin on that can then basically take that data and reassign it to uh, either uh, their station manager, project manager, or they could be the same, or all three, um, or to another collector, anyone in their group really. But maybe a flow would be that they uh, then assign these to the various station managers depending on where the data was collected, for instance. Um, that uh, station manager can then actually view and edit the data um, in this type of scenario. So really how you organize your data, you can either have all four of these different roles assigned to different people in your organization. They can all see and touch the data. Um, or you could have uh, just, let's say you didn't want the initial data collector for some reason to not to be uh, participate in the actual validation process of the data. Um, uh, you want a full four I review of stuff and for whatever reason you could eliminate project manager, get rid of station manager, and <clears throat> you could have it just be the group owner if you wanted to who um, can only see and touch the data at a certain point in the process. So it brings us to the um, actual the station manager and project managers themselves. Um, the stations, and they're both managed basically under two different tabs in the data center. So the, uh, uh, first of all, the projects, um, I think next slide, Luke, yeah. So if you're, let's say you're a project manager and you can, uh, you wanted to create a new project, you could go into the projects area, you create uh, a new project or an existing one. So this is an example just quickly of, um, of what a project uh, field form looks like. So uh, basically this has all the required fields for projects with um, CEDEN. Um, and it also enforces all of the, uh, the rules around what's required of these fields. So uh, the, the manager can then assign their project to a group, um, allowing that group manager to see, or uh, the group manager itself can uh, reassign a project to someone else if they needed to. Um, uh, likewise, uh, Stations has a similar kind of uh, interface where the, um, the station, this is an example of just editing an existing station in there. This has um, all the required fields also for seeding along with some um, extra swamp fields um, for um, uh, just additive help. But basically the, the workflow is, is the same. You have, uh, you can assign a uh, particular station to a project, the group owner can, can uh, manage that station or the station manager who they should assign it to, or you know, at any point they could switch that around to. So all these forms and fields, as I said, are CD, um, uh, compliant to uh, and hold the user to the um, to that what is required of, of CEDEN itself for, um, for validation of the data later, which we'll get into. Um, Either way, um, even if you're not interested in going to Seeden itself, um, they're just most of them are just standard rules, which are good um, bookkeeping habits, anyways. So next, um, so if you have all those management kind of uh, data management layers are kind of laid out there, um, it's good to some of the nuts and bolts of what happens with a data record itself. So. Um, Whoever it may be of those four roles you have editing, uh, what they can do is go in, highlight a, um, a particular re uh, record of interest, click the edit button. It will then launch into a, um, a form dialog uh, such as this, uh, just to give you an example, where uh, you know, every, then the editable um, fields are all displayed. All of the drop downs are also um, uh, loaded with CD standard vocabulary for selection, um, what's required from them in terms of that and validation. Uh, but so, and so, so the next slide, yeah. So here's an example of 
in the data center what might look like. For example, earlier in the lab book, we did um, a sample collection, right? And we had uh, ammonia as in. Uh, let's say you sent your sample out and you got to the lab and you got the results back. Now, so you could enter those in along with whatever other um, applicable fields were, were relevant to that. So, and then you could hit update and now you have your data. Um, you can see you can also switch projects and stations and assign data to different users depending on what the administrator wants to do with this area. So, so that's the main uh, kind of data record. In, in association with the main data record, then we have all of the, if you recall, the other 10 tabs in there. So we have a lot of, um, so this is an example of some of the fields for lab metadata along with the samples. These are all um, likewise seeding um, required fields, a lot of them. Um, and in addition, we have data quality assurance. Uh, a lot of these uh, likewise are required in, uh, for for upload and to CD. Um, one thing I want to draw your attention to was equipment ID. Uh, we also uh, provide a mechanism for you to, uh, under the equipment tab, record all of your instrumentation uh, for in the field use. Each one can be given a unique ID and uh, referenced here with all the appropriate fields and um, details needed for each piece of equipment. Uh, can be then tied to any number of calibration records. So if you do have a, a lot of groups have calibration days, if they're going to do a calibration day, they can then enter uh, all of the information at the calibration event with uh, for that piece of equipment, go in the field, do their data collection, identify, assign the equipment to that data, and then if they're doing post, they can see before and after calibration events and where exactly their data lies in relation to those. So there's a lot of quality um, control around also the equipment, not just um, the data and stuff that Tesla Water provides users here. So if, um, for especially for our California users um, who are would uh, be interested definitely likely in getting their uh, data into CEDEN, which is the California Environmental Data Exchange Network for those of you who um, aren't in California. Um, but Users who are interested in validating the data um, for upload and seeding, you basically have a simplified interface workflow. Uh, you can go to your lab book record and select yes, that this particular record you want to take through the validation process. Um, so you click yes on there, and then what it will do is shunt the data over to the validation um, tab area. In there, you can click on that as, we sh as I showed you before for, any, for editing, um, the same kind of editing interface applies here. And what you'll get in there um, is basically the system will enforce um, over 110 different sets of rules to, to the data itself in which uh, it will walk the user through to make sure that their data adheres to and meets all of those uh, requirements prior to um, allowing the, date, uh, the data to be marked by the user as validated. So after all of these rules are basically, once the user has met these, all of the requirements of, uh, of what the seeding database requires of the data, they at that point can then in the UI select for the, um, the field that says this data has been validated, please upload it to see and they can mark that as yes and click update. So when it's updated, it updates in the UI. Um, what that means is that what uh, in, our, in terms of our internal process is we periodically will query our database and find all relevant data that has um, passed the and meets the criteria ready for upload into Seeden. We will um, accumulate that data uh, and standardize it to format ready for processing by Seeden and we pass that over to the Seeden data administrators at that point. Um, after uh, basically the data has been then submitted, uh, we have in the data center itself, there's a submitted data tab in which um, all records for your um, safekeeping are, are then there with the time and date stamp uh, when the actual submission to Seeden occurred so you have that for your records. 
Um, uh, the last um, tab in the data center is the export data. So you, it's your data in <laughs> the data center, so you can do with it as you please. You can export it from here, and you can take it into uh, CSV, Excel, or print uh, it from there for your own records. Um, one of the main reasons why you might want to uh, export is uh, because we also provide a report tool. The report tool basically is a um, pre-configured template in uh, Excel which will automatically feed, grab your data and feed it in there where you can um, some built-in ability to kind of slice and dice your data and to do uh, some trending analysis, comparison and aggregation, um, and just kind of ways to use all of the, the power of Excel to uh, quickly kind of look at your data and do some things with it um, outside of the data center itself. Um, in addition, uh, we are always looking for uh, to improve ourselves and um, for our feedback from our user community is important to us. So we've built into the data center a mechanism for you to provide feedback to us. So, um, so uh, positive or negative, we, uh, we like it all because it helps us and improves us. Um, so we welcome uh, whatever um, you may have for us to, um, you know, in terms of feedback. So uh, last but not least, looking to the future, <laughs> we would like to get there together. Um, basically with Test the Water, we uh, will be offering, right now we're, we're completing our final um, stages of beta testing with the platform, but we'll be offering business licenses to funded nonprofits and for profits, offering various levels of support. Um, while well, citizen scientists and volunteer monitors have uh, the potential to bring large amounts of data to states and EPA for less costs, uh, with potentially even more area of coverage, uh, we, we're looking for funding uh, to support that kind of large citizen scientist volunteer monitoring community user base. Um, so we would really like to see it happen, um, and we're hoping we can all kind of get there together. So. Um, at this point, I think I just wanted to thank a few, uh, you know, people, especially uh, from uh, California groups out there, to Eric Perez for um, having us here tonight to speak. Um, also, Steve Steinberg and Christina Grosso and Reddy Tell, Cotton Wilson, and the S uh, SFEI and CD teams themselves, and then uh, our internal team here at Tesla Water. Also, if you uh, team members. Um, if you have any questions or want additional info, you can email us at info at fourmarbles.org, or you can feel free to just email me directly. It's Lee Tremblay at fourmarbles.org, and we look forward to hearing from you and, and working with you. So thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. I want to invite everybody to uh, submit your questions. You can do that via chat, or you can unmute with star six and ask uh, your questions of Lee and Luke. While we're waiting for that, uh, Lee, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your beta testing with the uh, actual citizen monitoring group? Uh, yeah, we well, this um, we're doing uh, basically this last. Uh, stage is we're doing um, completing some some with some of these uh, the newer features. What we were showing in here tonight were some of the um, some features that were coming in our next release. So basically, this spring we'll be doing some snapshot days and um, with some users and uh, hopefully getting their feedback and um, you know getting the final in the field kind of um, uh, groundwork laid with the product and. Um, all going well. We hope for an early summer, you know, 1.0 type release. So, okay, I have a couple questions here. I'll get to read them to you. Okay. Mhm. Mm okay. The first one happens to deal with uh, the GPS uh, coordinates when the device is turned off or when it's offline. Uh, is the GPS receiver independent of internet access, and will the Test the Waters app let me know if I have enough satellites or not. Uh, the yes, the the GPS itself is independent of your internet connection. Um, if you are using a device that doesn't have GPS, you you can also 
approximate location through IPs, but um, if you don't have that capability, anyways, uh, anyway, so in answer to the question, yes, the GPS is independent of your internet connection. Um, satellite connectivity, I haven't had, we've, we've done extensive testing around this, I've never had that, um, but uh, we, I'm trying to think, it would, it would not let you know that the data did not have a uh, location tag with it. But as I said, I think that would be a very rare instance. Uh, thank uh, you. Yeah. Uh, next question. Is there a way to take multiple measurements at a site for each parameter, but only take the average of those measurements as the final entry? Um, yeah, you could enter as many as you like for any parameter. Um, if you, uh, so the question is you want, they want to preserve all of their measurements along with the average too? I believe so. So yeah, so you can collect, you could collect all of those. Um, and in the data center itself, it will, there's a field for marking how many, um, how many basically, uh, uh, how many, measurements were made on a particular one so you could mark each of those for instance one through three if you did uh you know had a redundancy of three measurements um and then your your average you could mark as your your one that is connected to those as your average okay i just sent you a question in the chat lee Re, uh, I don't. I don't know if I understand the question. <laughs> uh, are the CAS RNs for each analyte retained? Uh, the CAS RNs. What's your? I'm sorry. I don't. Yeah, what, I don't know you, the vernacular either. Okay. Um, what, hopefully, she can get back to us in the chat. I can. Um, I can. I can Google that. <laughs> well, I, we have another question that's coming in from a, a citizen monitor. They are okay. in Orange, Orange County, and they have a very small citizen monitoring organization that I've worked with. Um, how can the system help to streamline their data process with all the roles for water testing? And would a station manager role be necessary for reporting? Uh, so I can answer that one because uh, one person can run the entire program. You don't have to have all those roles. Uh, and mm -hmm. I like the slide that you had laid out, Lee, with uh, how you can set up managing the test of waters. Uh, and then they also have a statement, uh, keep in mind that their own system in place is already for water testing, monitoring, reporting. Can this system integrate well with their current internal system or for any nonprofit internal database system, such as uh, I think they give a suggestion of a surf rider organization. Uh, I know a lot of our organizations have not been reporting to CEDIN uh, or WQX, and they've just been retaining the data themselves and maybe handing off an Excel file. So, Lee, if you can expand on, on how they can take their program and then ratchet up using your program, test the waters. Well, if you were um, coming to us as a a user, I mean, basically all new data, we want you to, in your process, adopt basically the platform and start using uh, your, move your current process forward with the platform. So all your data at that point, obviously, that you're collecting would be automatically integrated, right? Um, depending on what you've done in the past, every, um, it could be a variety of situations where if, if you have a database already, that's a different system. I mean, depending on what you were wanting from us, I mean, we could do a data migration and um, crosswalk of your data, or it, it, there could be any number of scenarios that could result from that. Obviously, um, depend. It's, it's hard to give an overall question to that, but most my immediate thing is, I guess, yeah, you'd have to do some kind of uh, crosswalk between your existing system and uh, and and this system so um, I'd be happy to whoever asked that to talk with you about that and what that might particularly you know 
mean for you guys and, and what you have at some point. Okay. So I'll, I'll try to make sure that you guys connect. Uh, going back to the uh, fire question, it was regarding the chemical abstract service registry number. Each chemical has a uh, CASRN, and since uh, a lot of chemicals have synonymous names. So I think that goes back to how all the different analytes are being addressed within the uh, seed and WQX database. So if you can I see. touch on that. Well, we, we've used the standard seed and name, naming or seed and vocabulary for analytes. So um, uh, whatever the standard is in there is what we have adopted for any, any one of those particular um, analytes. I don't know if that is that answer the question. Um, I, I I believe so. Yeah, CDN and, and WQX have been very rigorous to make sure that each analyte you're only putting in results for one particular chemical uh, compound or, or fingerprint. So we don't have five different names, five different ways of recording the data. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. We have a question coming in. Somebody working on an urban stormwater BMP pilot project. They're required to upload their data into CEDIN. So can test the waters translate the differences in monitoring urban stream runoff as opposed to rivers and streams? Uh, you mean, uh, so can it discern the difference? Well, the, uh, I assume or it sounds like they're asking about an analysis type um, question, but the of course we could handle the data. Um, now, what I, I analysis... think it has to do with uh, with project description. So, is it like ambient monitoring? Is it a point discharge? You know, is it uh, stormwater specific? So, wouldn't that be in your project description? Oh yes, yeah, yeah. So, is that what they're okay? Yeah. So, all of those um, types of whatever you're you're collecting your data on, what type of data? Um, what your instrumentation, everything that's, um, you know, kind of context uh, data like that uh, will be is available to you. And if you need to get your data to seed, and, um, we have all the standard vocabulary for those types of assignments of data types. So, you, uh, yeah, you should be good. I guess uh, we'd, we'd be uh, excited to talk to you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, next question. Is there a way for one person to add data to the report and another person to approve that data to be submitted to the station project group. So it's an administration question for you. Uh, yes. You could have a data collector um, submit data to a group. Uh, the group admin could then reassign that data to either a project manager or a station manager or uh, another data collector for that matter. Depending on whatever you needed, you could reassign and, and move the data um, uh, as you needed. Um, so okay. I think they're, they're asking about station managers. So yes, they could have the initial data that came in um, reassigned over to another station manager who could do all the review and um, you know all of the validation of the data. Right, thanks. That was their process. Yeah. Now, the next question has to do with uh, analysis of the data. And for, for each parameter, you know, a different region in the state of California could have a different water quality objective. You know, a, so if the value goes above a certain level, it'd be uh, in exceedance, and that may be okay. different for different states. So, is there a way that people can take a look at their data and easily find out if there's an exceedance? Uh, not in our, not in the current test the water. Um, yeah, we the only analysis uh, that we are providing right now is is in the report tool. Um, you could, I suppose, um, set in there uh, your thresholds in Excel, Luke. You might want to speak up on this, um, but we're above a certain level. We could, you know, you could color certain things so that it automatically triggered. Luke, does that um, sound like something you would? Yeah, we sell. we could build the report tool to easily include thresholds like that, especially in the the way it's built. Right, but, thank um, you. So it, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
the beauty of Excel, it's pretty flexible <laughs> with little effort. Yeah, and you have that that function for easily exporting it into Excel. So that, that'd be something that I think most of us state coordinators could help an organization with. Okay. But if you have any um, other questions, please unmute star six. You can ask your questions, or you can continue to submit questions via chat. I want to thank everybody for submitting their questions. This has been a great dialogue. Hi, uh, this is Amir Baum. I had asked a question about um, the uh, reporting system and how it can be integrated with uh, uh, organizations like nonprofits. Um, yeah, I have an, another question actually. I was at a beach water quality monitoring workshop uh, that was hosted by um, the Southern California Water Research Coastal Water Research uh, Program um, a, two, a month ago, and they ha they did a demonstration for called Beach uh, Demo 2.0 that the EPA is proposing to make the information more public about uh, beach closures when they're an exceedance of water quality standards. Um, I was wondering, is this database kind of in the same vein for promoting more public awareness of um, and access to uh, uh, water quality issues in uh, different watersheds? Is that, is, is, that, is that one of the goals of this database similar to the EPA one that they're working on? Uh, Amir, this is Eric. I was at that meeting. Oh, wow. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, I'm one no, of the, the co-facilitators for the uh, State of California Safe to Swim work group. So oh, yeah, that's right. You were there. Is, is one of my other work groups. So, yeah, uh, through CEDEN, we're trying to get citizen monitoring data, okay, put into yeah. it so then we can draw from it, okay? So be taking data that's in, been in CEDEN and using it within the Beach Watch program so that we were using all available data that meets uh, validation requirements for coastal management and for okay. sharing information with the public. Right now, we don't have that ability, it's, but uh, because of there's, there's guys working and, and, and doing stuff like test the waters and showing up at meetings like you were, we're going to be able to, in the future, take that citizen monitoring data and integrate it successfully. And it's extremely important for our freshwater systems because we don't have a lot of uh, safe to swim monitoring in our freshwater swimming holes and beaches on rivers. So Very safe true. to swim data is going to be extremely important, but it has to be in seed and for us to easily use it. Yeah, definitely, I, I agree, and um, I'm and I would I would hope with this. Uh, uh, database system for test the waters that it would, you know, meet those eventually meet those goals of you know, providing more uh access to the public for a freshwater system that it's safe to swim, uh you know, and that and that th those standards are being met, you know, for for certain criteria pollutants. Uh, thanks for your question and comment. Uh, Lee, oh thank you. I have another question that came in. Um they they missed some of the presentation, but they want to know uh, is there still funding needed, and is there a cost to use your platform? Um, currently, we are um, in our beta testing phase, as I said at the end. Um, obviously, to our beta testers, we have been offering the service for free as they, um, you know, are providing feedback and everything for us. Um, the in the future, with uh, as I had a slide on there that kind of outlined that we. You know, for for profits and any funded nonprofits um, who have the ability, we would will be entering into business licenses for depending on what level of support they're looking to um, to do their infrastructure. For in terms of funding, um, really for the larger kind of citizen scientists and volunteer monitoring groups, we are seeking funding currently. We are looking. Um, because it does take infrastructure, it does, um, you know, um, to actually uh, get that large user base, um, active, you know, um, supported. So that is what we're actively trying to do, so that we can support that user group. So um, funding is an issue for us at the moment in terms of kind of the barrier to entry with the citizen scientists volunteer monitoring group. But it is, um, I would say, a key part of our mission too. So. 
um, we are we are actively and um, you know making trying to make uh, you know as best headway with we in that direction as we can. So yeah, how, and, how is and that's what, not, how is being a nonprofit helping you guys on this, or, or is that an issue? Uh, uh, you guys, you, you, you guys are a nonprofit. That's what I'm trying to get across. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we're a 501c3 nonprofit, science and education based. Um, I think uh, it's um, I think yeah, just obviously people there's they understand there's that dimension where beyond trying to offer uh, just quality product and uh, you know that we have a, a public good public good works mission too. So. Um, yeah, uh, so, yeah, that's what I guess uh, part of our thing with that was just an open invitation for anyone who um, has ideas or avenues, too, for us or wants to join us in that, um, you know, that we were we we're looking for, um, you know, anyone who was, who was interested in, um, you know, joining us in this, uh, this these efforts. So. Okay, uh, another question uh, just came in. Um, how can cities and counties utilize the, this database to enhance reporting and analysis if they already have their own complex reporting system in place? What incentive is there for them to use this system along with theirs? Um, well, I guess if um, depends on what they're doing. Uh, if if they have. If they're looking for a system with full integration from in the field to um, to basically output in, uh, in in the future, you know, we're headed towards other than just California. We would like to be integrated with uh, WQX and uh, EPA. So for all of those, um, you know, regulated bodies who are who need that kind of full uh, from front end to the end, uh, you know, uh, that I don't know if that. Answers that they will provide all that service in between. Um, reports wise, um, it's that's a good um, point. We will be obviously when as data comes in and different groups, that would be part of our business licensing too. And depending on that level of support, if you needed that, we um, you know can tailor any any type of reports needed out of your data on the system. So it's um, just a matter of building the queries for you to actually run, you know. Okay. 